The benefits of financial freedom are numerous. Firstly, it offers you the freedom of choice. It provides the flexibility to make decisions based on your preferences rather than financial constraints. Whether you want to change careers, start a business, or take a sabbatical to pursue a personal passion, financial freedom grants you the ability to do so without the fear of financial repercussions. Hassan Afifi, how are you? I'm all right. How are you, Brian? Very good. Where are you? I'm in London. I'm at home. Whereabouts? In my uh, little cupboard here. <laughs> in, your, <laughs> in, your, in your cupboard of your spr sprawling palatial mansion, because you, you've, <laughs> you've worked out the secrets to financial freedom. And so money is not a challenge for you. Oh, I'm sure it's, it is a challenge, a challenge for everybody, but at least you've got your act together and that's good. You've got, you, you're in a good place, yeah? Well, I was, and then I wasn't, and then um, back onto it again. So that's... Well, uh, tell me the story. Tell me, the, tell me how, you, how you got to be, you, you, you were and then you weren't. And, and what, so what, what happened? Yes. Yeah, so um, I, I, I have had um, a sort of an unconventional career, let's say. Um, mm -hmm. Started as a scuba diving instructor when I was still a student at uh, school. And, mm -hmm. um, and where was, was this? My, in the Red Sea in Egypt. Nice place to be a scuba diving instructor. Indeed yes, it was. Yes. Yeah. 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 And um, that was my my main focus for many years. And then when I went to university, I was um, I studied economics and um, it just opened my mind to how to look at the world, really, in terms of a career in scuba diving doesn't have to be always about going underwater. It could be also about growing a business and looking at the market and, and so on. So there were two main things that caught my attention in my studies. And these were one was the business planning sort of um, direction. So uh, just the, the looking at any activity as a business and the other one was investments. And right. I guess um, at that time, there was no internet yet. So that's pre internet age. And um, so it, to, to be able to invest or trade in the US stock markets, and it, that that meant that I had to send first a fax to fidelity in the US. Um, and then send the documents by post <laughs> to for them to reply to me by phone to say that the account was open, then send me a fax with all the details of how to get in touch and so on. And investment back then was looking at the FT at the back pages, looking at the different companies, picking the ones that I wanted to invest in getting on the phone to the broker in the US saying buy this or sell that. So that, that was, uh, and if you like, this was actually more advanced than a lot of other markets. So <laughs> well, you were using was, a fax. <laughs> yes, that, that was, uh, that was very advanced, right? Yeah. And then a few years later, the, it, the internet started to happen. And, um, I was able to follow the markets with a 15 minute delay. And that was a massive, massive thing. Like I, I didn't just have to look at the FT every day at the end, you know, and see what the open clothes were and so on. But I was actually able to have some sort of as close as to real time as you can get by, by looking at this. So anyway, long story short, um, I continued to invest at the time and I still pursued my career in scuba diving. And with that, I was more aware of the environment and I wanted to focus more my investments on clean energy and so on. That was really early day, days for uh, things like um, solar energy. Wind energy was not really there yet at all. Um, so that was solar energy. I, I invested a lot in that and I failed miserably. I lost a lot of money in in solar energy. And 
And that was one of the very first lessons that I learned was it can be a great idea, but the timing has to be right for it to work as well. Um, so maybe that was 10, 15 years earlier than I should have invested. And that was a very, very valuable lesson to learn early on. Uh, thankfully, it wasn't that much money that I lost back then. But then I, uh, I pursued the, the, the investments in, in scuba diving and tourism in general and so on. And then I had to um, move to the UK with the family. Um, and uh, that was when I pursued more of a professional career in investments. And um, so my, my role was... Uh, what we call institutional equity sales. So they, this is basically all the big financial institutions. Uh, they have um, advisors all around the world or in different sectors who are specialists in regions or and so on. So my my first uh, role was uh, emerging markets. So. Middle East and Africa were my specialty, and I would talk to uh, the big names, the likes of BlackRock, JP Morgan, Morgan Stanley, all the big investment managers um, for their investments in the Middle East and Africa first. And um, that was my main role was basically to um, advise them on their investments, whether they already had the investments there and tell them what to do with them or to uh, give them ideas or to tell them get out of there or get into here and there. And these people, when you're talking to the fund management team of a big outfit like Tiro Price or JP Morgan or uh, Goldman Sachs and so on, you're not talking about someone who's just looking at the world uh, through the newspapers. These are very sophisticated PhD in econometrics and, and so on. So the language that you're using, the ideas that you're giving them, and you're one of thousands of advisors that they have. So you had to have some kind of something that is of use to them in order to tell them. Mm -hmm. So I had to learn very quickly how to really adapt my language as well as my advice and so on to, to their thinking. And that made me learn a lot because I would, the, the exposure that I got to these many fund managers, top fund managers in the world, and you can see immediately who's better than who because you have a, a, a sort of a bird's eye view over all of these different fund managers. And, um, and within each asset management company, uh, you would deal with different teams as well. So I would deal with the global uh, team, with the emerging markets team, with the frontier markets team, uh, with the telecoms team, with the mining team. And so there are very different uh, teams within these asset managers and you immediately start to form your own investment philosophy, if you like. And um, because it's, it's, a, it's a great lesson to learn from what is supposed to be the best in the world, right? Mm -hmm. And these are not talking theory, they are actually investing in these things. Obviously, the way that they invest is very different from how you and I would invest because, because of the size. So when a very big asset manager who is probably managing, at the moment, some of these are, are managing in the trillions of dollars, not billions, wow. but trillions. Wow. So, um, when they are investing somewhere, they're not going to invest half a million dollars or a million dollars. They, the, the minimum investment that they would put into any company is probably 10 to $20 million. Wow. So the way that they would enter or exit these investments is very different from you and I getting on our phone and placing an order for 100 shares of Apple for what, is, what seems to be a fortune to us, $10,000 or something, it's a very different ball game for what they do. But the, the approach of analyzing the investments and so on, this is a very, very specific way because they are looking at very long term and, and very, very far ahead 
uh, into the future. The investment world is very different to what we see on social media, which is short term trading. Yeah. So the difference between the two here is basically what you would consider when you're buying a house to live in. That's an investment. So yeah. you would be looking at yeah. what we would call in the investment world, the fundamentals. You would yeah. look at the area. You would look at schools, the hospitals around you, the services, the supermarket, the road. Is it a dodgy one or is it nice? Or or maybe there is a, a tube station that is uh, or, or some transport uh, link that's going to open soon and so on. So you would look at these fundamentals. And once you're happy with that, you would start to look at the specific properties that you're going to to buy and compare the prices, compare the, the actual properties to each other until you find the one that you're actually convinced with. And this is like you go in and you say, I'm home. Then you make your offer and then you buy the place. Mm -hmm. Once you buy the place, you stop looking at the prices of houses. Yeah, that's it, because yeah. you have valued this property to what it is worth to you at that time. And that was it. Yeah, not just financially. Look. What is it actually worth as far as lifestyle exactly. and the rest exactly. of it goes? Yeah. yeah. So th this is this is what we call the fundamental analysis of that investment. That you're looking at at what it what this investment is worth to you because you know you're going to be living there forever. You're not going to start looking at the prices unless one of several things happen. M maybe you want to upgrade or downgrade uh, your if you're young, you're having a new family, you're expanding the family, you want more bedrooms, so you start to look at alternatives. So you want to sell this because you want to buy something else. It's not you're selling it because it is bad, but it doesn't suit you now. Or you're, you're going to, uh, your kids have, have left home and you want to downgrade. So that, that could be another thing. So that, this is, these are the only times that, or in, in some, situations where crime is high and you want to move from this area or you have elderly parents somewhere that you want to move closer to them whatever it is you're going to start looking at the the price of houses because you want to sell them but that's the only time you're going to start looking at the price again so it doesn't matter what's happening around you the the property market around you is going up or down or any of that stuff really doesn't matter to you anymore because you're living there, that's your long-term investment. It is very different to when you're buying to rent or yes. you're buying to flip. Yes. And this is this is trading. This is a very different point of view because then you're buying because you want to be buying at a low price that you're going to sell later on at a higher price, or you're going to buy and improve the property and in order to sell it for a higher price. But this, this needs a little bit more money because you have to have the cash in order to do this. So in the world of investment, this is, this is what you would be looking at. People right. are not interested in what the markets are doing. They're interested in the investments that they're going to be putting their money in. So if you, as Graham today, come to me and say, well, look, I have this idea of opening a shop that sells, I don't know, uh, tiles, right? And you give me a business plan and you give me your experience as a, a tile salesman, I don't know, and I'm convinced and I would invest in your tile business, right? So you would go and you show me the shop that it's on a good street and that there are traders around that can go and buy the tiles from you and so on. So th this sort of thing, that's the, the investment. I would have to analyze it from a fundamental point of view because I'm going to become your partner in that business. Even though I don't have any input, I might do or I might not, depending on several factors. But let's say I'm just going to be a silent partner. You need the cash in order to expand or whatever. So I'm going to give you the cash for a percentage of that company and you run your company. And I am convinced that this is a good business. In a couple of years time, I start to reap the benefits of it by 
getting some dividends or whatever it is, right? Mm -hmm. So when we're analyzing a business, whether it's a tile shop, a restaurant, or Apple or Tesla, it's the same thing. Right. So that's, that's the exact same thing. If I'm investing in that company, I have to be convinced that this is the right business in the right market with the right management team. So this is really key to investment. And what a lot of people get wrong most of the time is that they look at, I don't know, the, 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 the illusion of <laughs> like, I'm going to be investing in the stock market because I can double my money. That's right. not how it works. Right. You're investing in a business, you're investing in an economy, if it's a whole market, you're investing in, in something that is long term, you're becoming a shareholder in an actual business. Yeah, that's the investment. It's a very different story from trading. Trading is you are, you can be you're basically are you're you're making use of an arbitrage of some discrepancy in the price or the fundamental value of the company that you're buying or that investment. So yeah. you're looking at these in, uh, uh, companies in the stock market and you say, actually, I believe that over the coming six months, let's say, Apple will launch something that should bring up the price. So the sentiment at the moment, maybe Apple price is low because the market is sentiment is low because of whatever factors that are going on, whether it's macro factors, that is the economy or whatever, or it is something specific to the company. But you can see something in the future, which we call in trading terms, the catalyst that's going to drive the price back to where it should be. So if Apple price, let's say it's $100 today, and you see that it's worth 115 or 120 dollars and you know the catalyst that's going to increase the price by that much then you start your trade right what people do is that they they do the the fear of missing out so they see the markets going up and that fomo is basically that they are when they see green they are like they feel like they're missing out on that rally, so they have to buy, so they end up buying, and all of a sudden, the markets come back down, and when they see red, they panic, so they sell. So they so they, so they bought when it was high, and they sold when it was low, which is exactly the opposite that. of, of exactly how that. business so works. They, they yeah. use emotion rather than an actual approach to investing or trading that, that is built on actual scientific approach, right? And yeah. when I say scientific, it doesn't have to be very sophisticated, right? It can be very, very basic understanding of a business as well. But you have to understand what you're getting into. And right. if it's a long term investment, you're, you're convinced of that company, then you put your money in it. And you don't look at what the markets are doing, because that's it, you're, you're a partner in that business, you're in if you're trading, yeah then you have to understand the market dynamics and you have to have that catalyst if that catalyst date comes. So you have to have a timing as well yeah. on it. Yeah. And if that catalyst comes and whether the price goes up or down, you have to get out of that trade and that's it. Right. And then you start over some, somewhere else. So that's and the difference where, between trading and investing and people get those confused, do they? Completely, completely, very, very different. And and this is th th that very long introduction to that whole thing is that this is something I learned early on in my investment career when, when talking to, um, to these big institutions right. is that when they're managing the money of some endowment fund that's worth $50 billion of Harvard University or some uh, sovereign wealth fund of Norway or something like this. They're not interested in what happens to the market today or six months from now. That's irrelevant to them. Completely irrelevant. When they're convinced of a business or a sector in, in a country or a region, that's it. They're going to go in regardless of what happens to the markets. 
Of course, they don't want to drive the markets up while they're buying and people knowing that they're buying and so on. So that there is that delicate balance of not driving the markets up or down when they're when they're moving. Yeah. But they're just convinced that difference of a dollar or two dollars doesn't really matter. If you invested in Coca-Cola in 1985, when the dividend yield was something like 1%, you would be getting what you're in what you invested in 1985 in coca-cola in dividends every year now wow wow, wow. so if you would have put a hundred dollars in coca-cola then and yeah. you're saying oh maybe it's one dollar dividend yield you know it's, it's not that great today you would be getting a hundred dollars every year every year. and it goes yeah. up right yeah. and so so that's their view is 30, 40, 50 years in advance. It's not a matter of what's going to happen next week or next month or even next year. Yeah. They think in decades in advance. Obviously, yeah. when we go back to, to individuals, that's a very different and very difficult thing to do. Yes. So this is where you can learn certain lessons from that and adapt it to individuals right yes and yeah. that adaptation starts to to happen when you're looking at very different like it, it, you have to categorize your goals your financial goals first of all so there is the ultimate goal is that you retire comfortably yes. right so that's that's the first goal for everyone even if you're 16 years old you have yeah. to think about that yeah. and this is where a lot of people might get it wrong because they think I'm still 16, I'm still 18, I'm still 30, still very far away in the future. I'm not going to think about it. But I can't remember the exact numbers. I, I should have been a bit more prepared. But the 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 numbers I was I, because I was writing another book recently about like the what to do for uh, as a parent for the children. Yes. And if, for example the grandparents give a gift for a newborn of 2000 pounds or something and yeah. you put them in in an investment that's going to be following the s p 500 and forget about it by yeah. the time they're 65 they're going to have about three million pounds wow and that's it's it's and you haven't done anything you haven't added to it you haven't done and that's because the interest compounds is that you get the interest on the interest. exactly it's the returns yeah. it's not interest yeah. it's it's the returns on on that investment so yeah. over a long period of time, if, if you're looking at market fluctuations, they, they don't matter much, right? Because right. the average over 20 years, 15 years, 30 years is more or less between 12%, 15%. So what I always do is that I calculate it over 10 to 12%. And, and that's a realistic return on investment if you're just going to invest in the S&P 500. And mm -hmm. for me, the investment in something like an index fund is, it makes the most sense. And an index fund, just explain that for anyone who's okay, not sure what so, that is. Yeah, sure. So an index is basically a basket of companies that are listed on a stock exchange. And it can be any, any kind of different indices. So for example, in the UK, we have the FTSE 100, which is the largest 100 companies that are listed on the London Stock Exchange. Yeah. In the US, the S&P 500 is the largest 500 companies that are listed on the New York Stock Exchange. Okay, And then there is the NASDAQ 100, which is the 100 largest companies on the NASDAQ, which is a different stock tech. exchange to the New York Stock Exchange. It's yeah. mainly tech, yeah. Oh, it's my, okay. Um, yeah. yeah. So... So basically, if it, it, the the best performing markets are U.S. markets, if we're going to look at the FTSE 100, it's not that great over a long period of time. It is very good in terms of dividend yield, more or less, but it's better than the U.S. But the U.S. in terms of growth, it's it, it cannot be beaten until now, unless right. you're looking at like in in a short period of time at certain emerging markets and so on. But there is a lot of risk in terms of currency, in terms of political and regulatory issues like China or certain African countries and so on. So the, the safest one until now, let's just line, put a line under that, is the US 
economy and the U.S. market because yeah. these are the largest companies in the world. Yeah, and they, they you cannot compare any other companies in the world with the size of U.S. companies. Yeah, right. And these are again, they're global companies. When you're talking Apple, they don't just sell in the U.S. They sell everywhere. When you're talking, yeah. I don't know. When you're talking Microsoft, Microsoft sells everywhere, and so yeah. on. Yeah. And the advantage of something like the S&P 500 is that it changes all the time. So if you look at the index in 1940 and which companies were in the S&P 500, and you look at the S&P 500 in the 1980s, you look at it in the 1990s, it follows the global trends, right? Because these companies are within the sectors that are growing, that are doing well at the time. And because they're in the top 500. So there's out. a reason why they're exactly. in the top 500. Yeah, exactly. So you had the banks at some point, you had uh, the industrial uh, companies at some point, you had tech at some point, and then it changes over time. And the advantage of something like this is that you don't even have to think about what goes on in there, right? Because you're always going to be invested yeah. in the best 500 companies <laughs> in in the US. I'm not going to say yeah. in the world, but in the US. Yeah. And that's really it. What happens is that the the drops that happen in these markets are temporary and they happen for several reasons. One is that you might have a pandemic. You might yeah. have a, a global uh, financial crisis. You might have a tech bubble that bursts and so on, right? And when these things happen, like the tech bubble uh, in, in the beginning of the 2000s, what happened was the markets went down, but then the companies that were failing, they went out of the index and the successful ones, they took over. So yeah. it was temporary until the better companies came back in and then you have the rise of that index again. And this is why the, the, these fluctuations of one, two, even three, four years they don't really matter in the long term because yeah. ultimately you just want that because the drop, for example, in 2020, what happened after the pandemic, you had companies that dropped by, I don't know, 70%, 80%. But what happened in 2021 was a massive run. It was like, if you look at the charts of markets and what happened between March, 2020, and mid 2021, you can see like ridiculous rise in these markets. The Nasdaq wow. went up by 50% or something. So it, it, you can have these periods of massive rallies yeah. and you can also have these periods of massive drops. But yeah. ultimately, if you're looking at the bigger picture over 30, 40 years, these big massive drops and whatever, it's a little blip in the, in the grand scheme of things right and you just have that smooth 10 to 12 percent that goes on over time right and this is really a, a a mindset that that needs to be understood by people when they're when they're going into this journey because financial freedom is not just about i'm going to be making a million pounds what are you going to be doing with a million pounds this is really the key because you find these people who win the lottery and then six months later, five years later, you you hear the news that they went bankrupt and so on. The statistics are frightening. I think, it, I think it's like most lottery winners are broke inside. It's something ridiculous, like five years. Because They're back they where they were. they don't know what to do with it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And <laughs> having, having seen what people do with the money and having understood what, what the money should do, this is, this is really the key in yeah. that you have to work it backwards. The financial freedom means that you can be sleeping at night, not worrying about whether you have a job or not, how you're going to be paying for your bills and your home, right? This is really the, the key. Yeah. You don't have to worry about the money. Yeah. And, and what does this, what this means actually in, in actual fact is that the, the, the money that you make has to be generating an income for you while you're asleep and you're not worrying about. It. Right. 
So what happens is that if we're going to talk about let, let's let's work it again with the with the retirement side of things. So when you, when we're looking at building a pension, I want to know how much I need in my pension pot at the end in order to be comfortable, right? Yeah. So if, yeah. for example, let, let's let's take theoretical numbers and 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 work it from there. If I'm going to say that. Fifty thousand pounds a year is going to be enough for me to be very comfortable, and 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 this is for expenses, right? So right. this is for your food, your groceries, your um, bills, um, a couple of holidays a year to somewhere fancy, and assuming that because you're retired, assuming that you've paid off your mortgage, fifty thousand sure. pounds is actually a very decent amount if you are yeah. taking out the housing from it. Yeah, that's, and you're out of debt. You don't have a massive car loan and that's student 4, loans and all the other. Yeah. That that you're if if you're paying five hundred pounds, six hundred pounds a month on groceries, you still have three and a half thousand pounds that are left to play with, right? Yeah. yeah. So you can actually be living in 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 actual luxury with fifty grand. Yeah. Right. Yeah. In order to achieve this fifty thousand pounds a year, let's work it. The second step: How am I going to what investments should I have in order to bring me that fifty thousand pounds a year? Mm-hmm. So there are investments. Whether it's um, I, I prefer the high dividend yield. So high dividend yield investments. It means that it's you're investing in companies that distribute part of their profits to you as a okay. dividend. Yeah. So yeah. there are growth companies that the, these they reinvest the profits in order to grow, and then there are companies that are like. Uh, Procter and Gamble, uh, BAE Systems, uh, the, uh, British American Tobacco. If if you're okay with investing in tobacco, but, um, it, it, there there are oil companies that you can invest in. There are companies that do not need to grow more than they have already, and so most of the profit that they make they distribute to shareholders, and that's the dividend distribution. Mm-hmm. So again, I wouldn't invest in these individual companies. I would invest in a in a fund that invests in these. So someone else is doing the job of finding these companies and and changing them and whatever. Maybe I would not be getting the full like potential of getting the the best returns. But at least I can sleep at night and not having to worry about which companies I'm going to be investing. In. Yeah, yeah. So, so these funds they average according to market conditions. They average between four to eight percent per year in terms of w- when you get into the investment. Okay, so yeah. you can invest a hundred grand and you get four grand out of this as a four percent. So let's say an average of five percent return as a dividend uh, return on these funds is a realistic one. So if I want fifty thousand pounds, so I need a million pounds in my pension pot in order to make that fifty thousand. Right. Yes. How to reach that million pounds is really the key. Yeah. And again, like in whichever age you are, if you haven't started, you have to start now. Okay. Yeah. And this is again like the in order to achieve this so you can use these online calculators i speak about it in the book right and you go to the one that i use is called the calculator site.com it's free and i go on it i find like the monthly payment uh calculator or something and i enter i now have zero let's say and i want to achieve a million pounds and i know that during that growth period until i reach there I'm going to be investing in an S&P 500 fund. Yeah. Okay. And I'm going to be contributing every month to that to that pension pot. So every month I'm going to be investing however much money into there and it will tell me and and I will say this is how many years I have until until retirement, let's say. Yeah. So for someone who is 25 or 30, they have 30 or 35 years in the future in order to invest. So they might end up with something like, I don't know, 150 pounds a month yeah. to put in order to reach a million pounds by retirement. Right. Yeah. And yeah. 
a lot of people might say, oh, okay, so how do I account for inflation and all of these things? What you do is that every year you increase it by the amount of inflation. So right. at the end, you're, you're talking about a million pounds by today's value. Yes. But if the you're equivalent. increasing it every year yeah. by the inflation amount, then you adjust for that. And at the end, that million today might be a million and a half and you still have that. And the 50,000 might be 75,000 by the future uh like the calculation and that would be the value that that you get but just to keep it simple is that you you're just going to invest that money into the pension pot and with with an account like a sip that's the yeah. self-invested personal pension you can you can open a sip in two minutes really you go on any of the like vanguard the hargreaves lansdowne whatever there are a lot of them around and you can open that and what happens is that automatically, if you're on, if you're a basic taxpayer, uh, like the basic rate, okay, so you're you're not earning massive amounts. You're just yeah, you're in the twenty percent normal. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. What you would get on every eighty pounds that you're going to put into there, you're going to get twenty pounds more, so that the total is a hundred pounds. Where does the extra right? twenty come from? Oh, because you're not paying it in tax. Right. So that's the tax rebate that you're getting from the government. So yeah. you're basically, so if your total contributions are going to be a hundred pounds, what you actually have to pay is 80 pounds. Yes. Right. So in actual fact, the government puts in 25% on top of what you put in. Yeah. To bring it that that's the 20%. Like if you're working it backwards, right? Yes. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. for each 80 pounds, they're going to be putting 20 pounds. So actually that person if if your monthly contributions are going to you're going to find that it's 150 pounds you actually have to pay 150 pounds times 0.8 that's the actual amount that you're going to be paying into that sip yes and it yeah. automatically takes it from your account every month it automatically invests it into the fund for the s p 500 and you forget about it yeah and at the beginning when when if you're putting like the minimum 20 or 20 pounds or something and you're saying how on earth am i going to reach that million pounds it doesn't really matter because and, and this is where a lot of people get very discouraged right because they keep looking and they keep saying oh, i'm only now like 500 pounds how on earth am i going to reach half a million it's, it's that that really is not the case or the markets are coming down massively and actually what happens when the markets come down is that every time you're buying, you're improving your average entry price. So when the markets come back up, you're not just going back up from where you bought at the high price, but your, your average is going down as well. So when the markets come back up, they're improving, right? So the, the overall investment is improving over time. And this is why the average growth is 10 to 12%. Yes, you have years of a drop of 50 60 percent but then over time you're going to be having that steady 10 to 12 percent and and it compounds yeah right so yeah. this is really the the key is is not having massive amounts of money now is just yeah. starting slowly right and every yeah. time you're going to have an extra amount of cash you need to be putting it into something like this so yeah. this is somewhere the, the other one is obviously the ISA, which is the individual savings account, and that's tax-free. It yeah. doesn't give you any benefits other than it doesn't take any tax if you're making a profit, but yeah. that's a massive thing as well. Yeah. And if you want to retire early, this is where you would want to put your money because yeah. there is no limit as to when or how when to take money out or how much you can take out of it. You can take out money. You can. There, there is a limit as to how much you can put in, which yes, is twenty, 20 thousand pounds a year. A year, yeah, yeah. yeah. But yeah. there is no limit as to how much you can take out of it. There is no limit as to how many times you can take money in or put it back in or whatever. All the investments. It doesn't really matter what happens. Yeah. With the SIP, you have limits on age, mm -hmm. so you cannot. You cannot do anything before you reach 57 years old, or if you're older now, it might be 55. And you have 
up to 25% from the amount that you have at that time in the SIP account that you can take out without any penalties. Mm -hmm. Anything you take above the 25%, you're going to be pay paying tax on as income right. tax. Right, right. So, so again, like th th that's a limitation. So you can actually retire at 57 in theory with a SIP account and not 65, mm -hmm. yeah. right? So that's, yeah. that's one thing. But if you're far away from there, you're earning a decent salary, a fresh university graduate uh, with, who happened to land a decent job with decent income, they can be investing a lot into an ISA, again, into an S&P 500 or NASDAQ 100 uh, fund over several years. They would just be contributing to that as well as their SIP because the SIP has to be there all the time as well. Mm -hmm. And then because you have to make it to benefit from that extra 20% that you're getting every time you're putting money, there's 25% extra cash that's being put in. And then if you're even like a higher tax payer, a higher rate taxpayer, then you're even getting more money and yeah. it can be discounted from your, your actual pay slip. Th yeah. There is a way around it that you can um, report it to HMRC and they give you that as a refund or they change your tax code so mm -hmm. that you give it to your employer and your employer would then charge you less tax, even though you're supposed to be earning to, to pay the 40% or 45%. So th th there are benefits to putting money into a SIP yeah. from a tax point of view, but that's an advanced thing for someone okay. who's earning more money and they can actually have their own personal advisor in that. But yeah. in general, for for mere mortals like us, we can just do the, the normal 20% and that's a big benefit. But yeah. if you're investing into, into an ISA over 10, 15, 20 years, you can actually be retiring very early because you might end up with that pot of money that's going to be earning you tax-free money yeah. Again, like because it's in an ISA, yeah, and you're re you're retired when you're 40, 45, or or whatever age because you've reached that potential. Because again, market conditions might happen at some point in the future that they in like they improve very much with yeah. your investments with them, and you might find yourself with that big pot of money there. So you take it out of that, you put it into a high dividend yield fund that's going to be generating income for you and you're done right yeah then you yeah. have to worry about about retiring in the future and whatever and that's that's a later stage but again like some of the things like one of the mistakes that i have made before was starting a business with all the money that i had right and it's a right. very stressful period because but you, you must have, have at the time thought income. you must you must have thought though at the time well i'm not borrowing money so i'm ahead yes but you have a house you have kids you have commitments and and this is where like the, the honeymoon period of starting a company like it hits you in the face and then reality like oh no what am i going to do now right like yeah. the, the money's gone there isn't any regular income. There is a day that you're going to be making a lot of money. There are six months that you're not going to be making any money, but you have salaries to pay, you have bills to pay and so on. So this is this is very dangerous zone as well. And mm -hmm. by preparing for it from a financial point of view in two ways can, can actually make it a much easier um, thing to do. So one thing is that I am 100% with the view that do not start a business unless you have regular income that's coming in from employment sunk. Right. So run it as a side hustle first. Until it becomes profitable and it, and, it, and the income from it is enough to sustain you, then you can quit your job. And mm -hmm. that can be gradual as well. It doesn't have to be abrupt, right? Mm -hmm. The business mm -hmm. might be growing. You might be, it might be bringing in some income, maybe two, three hundred pounds a month. You might take a day, like go part time, do four days a week, right? Yeah. But still, yeah. you have that safety of the salary coming in, because mm. if anything goes wrong with that business, you're really stuffed if if you're if yeah. you can't if you can't make ends meet, right? Yeah, yeah. And 
And then you, you start to, to gradually move from the employment towards the entrepreneurship. And that's, that's where you can actually move towards that. But the yeah. other thing that you can do is that if you want to start a business, do not start it with the money that you have to pay your bills with. Yeah. Meaning that if you want to start a business, whatever it is, it's going to take some capital of some description. Yes. Right? And it doesn't have to be all from you. It can be from other investors and so on. But that's a later stage. The first stage is that, okay, so a big part of a job that I've done before was corporate finance. And I have, I have looked and raised money for hundreds of companies. And every time an entrepreneur comes in with an idea, they think that their idea is going to be like the best in the world and whatever it might be, but they think that this is enough to raise funding, right? Yeah. And that really is not enough. For an investor, they want to invest into something that they, why are they going to invest their money in you and not in Apple? It's, yeah. it's a very easy question. If, if you yeah. think you're better than Apple, you have to prove it, right? Yeah. yeah. And, and the way to prove it, the easiest way to prove it is that you already have the product or the service in place. Yeah. If you're raising money from day one, you have a disadvantage because you're going to be selling your business very cheaply. So if you think that your business is worth a thousand pounds, let's say, if someone is going to come in from day one, they're taking a very big risk because they have to believe you. Yeah. And that risk has a price. So they might pay you instead of that thousand pounds, they might pay you 500. But if you can prove that you already have the product or the service and the track record, even if it is just six months yeah. or a year, yeah. then that thousand pounds might be 1,500 or even 2,000 pounds because you already have proof of concept there. Yeah. So in order to reach that stage, you have to plan the funding in phases. So phase one has to be self-funded 100%. Yeah. And you, yeah. in order to do that, you have to save for it. Yeah. So that money needs to be saved first Yeah. and needs to be accounted for in your budgeting when you're doing the whole looking at the whole financial situation of your life yeah. right you have your bills you have uh, the the retirement pot you have your isa to to put it put money in you have your fallback or the emergency fund that you have to be funding as well but yeah. also then after all of these are paid you then put some money aside for your new venture once yeah. you have enough money in order for you to start it, to be able to start it, then you start it. Yeah. It doesn't have to be today. The world can wait. <laughs> and actually, in six months time, if it takes you six months or a year in order to start that, that opportunity that you think or you thought that you might have lost, you will have matured more that you are going to see many more variations of it and tweaks and and so on by the time you have enough money in order for you to invest and start that venture it's going to be a very different story because yeah. then you can actually be doing something worthwhile yeah once this is done if the business starts to generate enough income in order for you to to be able to grow it that's fine if not then you start to go for raising fi financing from others and so on but that first part needs to be budgeted with everything else right. but it has to be separate from your day-to-day -day bills and your family basically and even if you're a single person you do not want to be in a situation where you have to go back to family for handouts or going back to live with your parents or it, it's it's never a great thing or in in some extreme cases you might go homeless right that you might end up homeless and and this is really it, the idea might be great but the timing might not be right like my investments in solar energy in the early 1990s right yeah and that's that's really the, the main thing right yeah so 
when we're talking about financial freedom, we have to really look long term. We have to think about investment. And again, it is not something that the wealthy only can do. And this is really key. And it doesn't have to be the young people only can do. It doesn't matter what your age is. It doesn't matter how much money you're making. There has to be a way of adjusting in order to reach that. And it is not easy. It is simple. It is very simple because it is very straightforward. But it's not easy sometimes because you have to make compromises. You have to the the your, the house that you're living in might be uh, the, not the right one for you at the time because it is costing you too much that you're not able to put aside the money so you will yeah. have to make a decision of downsizing or going to a different area or whatever in order to pay less and this is something these days especially with mortgages going up even if you're renting probably landlords are going to be increasing the the rent as well because they have the, the the mortgage payments to pay that are going higher my mortgage payment at the moment has gone probably it's it's gone up by 80 percent over the last six months wow 80 because it was fixed and then all of a sudden it, it, the the period of the fixed mortgage was done at the time yeah. when the interest rates were going up and all of a yeah. sudden what i was paying six months ago it's yeah. it, now it's it's almost half of what i'm paying now so that, this happened, is really that happened to us too. We were on a, a fixed rate for, for the first five years. Yes. We've, we've, we've been in this flat, this particular flat, uh, five years. And about three months ago, uh, that, that fixed thing came off. But we were lucky because yeah. pre, pre audio books, because I've only been doing audio books since 2020. Uh, mm -hmm. So three years. Pre audio books, I was always paid well because I worked in broadcasting and I was very lucky to have right. some, some decent jobs. And we managed mm. to, to make enough overpayments on the mortgage that by right. the time it went up, we owed a lot less. So mm -hmm. it kind of balanced that. We are paying more each month, but not 80%. But yeah, yeah. I can see how people can. So, get so we, 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 if, if a landlord had the same situation that I'm in now and I'm renting out my place, I would have to put up the rent. Yeah, yeah. Because I have no choice, right? And and again, even if you're renting, you will have to consider if this is affordable. And it is not a very easy thing to do to take your family out of an area or take your kids out of a school to move to another area and so on. It is very, very difficult. And, mm. and most people would consider it almost impossible to do that. But that's the responsibility that we have to take as parents or as families or even as a, as a single person who is just starting it's it's something that you do not want to get into debt because you were stubborn because you didn't want to move right and yeah. then five years down the line when you're really in the red and you are in a very bad situation then you are going to be making much worse decisions you might have to declare bankruptcy or you have to do some sort of something with the with your creditors it's it's a very very difficult situation and and the hole gets deeper and deeper so this is where you have to re really cut your losses and then start over because then you'll thank yourself later on that you did that early on yeah and this is not a very very easy thing to do it's it's very easy theoretically because if if you have a pen and paper you say yeah well if you're spending this maybe you can cut it by that and it's not a matter of cutting like i don't know a cup of coffee for two pounds and stuff like that this is all really superficial i'm talking about bills like an electricity bill that's 80 pounds or 70 pounds that's it builds up uh, the gas bills have gone up massively recently again after they finished their the the government uh, schemes and so on so all of these things they, they they are they are not very easy to do yeah and it involves a lot of very hard decisions and it can put the strain on families and relationships and so on but it is a must to to have and and if you're prepared for it early on then all the better right yeah if you're a young person between 18 and 39 you can open that lifetime isa 
you can put up to four thousand pounds a year in it and the government gives you a thousand pounds on top of that because you can use it as a deposit for your first home yeah. so this is again like the, the, that's something that if if you're young or you're a parent you need to do this immediately for your kids right and, yeah. and or for yourself because if you're between 18 and 39 that's the window start this account the lifetime isa put as much money in it as you can if you don't have already your own home because that's going to be if you're not investing that money if you're just putting it in cash in there you're getting 25 percent on top of it immediately yeah so yeah, yeah. within three four years you can have enough money to put as a deposit on on a house yeah and it's something that is really a, a very big thing that most people who rent the only problem they have is that they cannot build up enough savings to put as a deposit on a house and yeah. the rent is just a vicious cycle at the end because they cannot get that deposit initially right because they're paying so the rent you, out each if, month yeah yeah exactly exactly but again this is another decision that you, you can downsize while you're building up that other side it's not very easy it's a simple theory yeah it's not but it's not easy to actually do it right but yeah as as long as you have that account that you're feeding regularly then over time you're going to thank yourself in the future right and i'm glad i did this and then that's that's done right yeah. and and this is the these are the bits and pieces that one can do either for themselves or their families or their loved ones and they can actually end up with with that and so even even someone on a very low income it's it's a very difficult thing to do but to put out so, so for example if the, the minimum that i would do personally is that i would have a sip and an ice and if i'm young i would add to that a lifetime ice okay and i have this is not an advert but i personally use hargreaves lansdowne because i can actually i i open accounts for my kids in there and i can just access their accounts i can choose the investments and so on i cannot take the money out they because they're over 18 they can do whatever they want but but i can do the investments for them. and and basically what what happens is that it's automatically i i have the minimums so you would start with the minimums Let, let's forget about how much you can afford if, if you're on a low income this has to be a priority actually before going out before taking holidays before anything else it's housing bills and then this mm -hmm. and this would be 20 pounds for the sip which is the minimum 25 pounds for an isa and 25 pounds for a lifetime mm -hmm. so that would be 70 every, pounds a month every month yeah 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 and this has to be a necessity it's not even an option that you should have so if you cannot afford the 70 pounds, you have to find a way to afford the 70 pounds. Mm -hmm. And this is really the key. And as soon as this starts to build up, that's that's when like you leave it and, and just put it there. You do it automatically that it invests in a fund that invests in the S&P 500 and leave it. And it takes it automatically from your uh from your account every month and you don't have to worry about it mm -hmm. in a few years time then you're when you open it and look at it then you're going to realize okay i'm glad i did this because then you forget about the sip because that's far in the future but the isa and the lifetime isa these are very very important the lifetime isa is going to enable you to pay a deposit on your first home and your ISA might help you in the future with retiring early if you want to, um, it, having something uh, for investing, whatever it is that you want to do, right? Mm -hmm. And all of this, I am assuming that people are also saving in an emergency fund. And that's really the most difficult part to do. The emergency fund is really the most difficult thing to build up because it's in a normal savings account. It's very easy to access. The it has to be on call. Always there because it's for an emergency. Yeah. 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 So the temptation is always there, and but but then 
instead of using a credit card, okay, I'm obviously talking about someone who is not in debt yet. Yes. Okay, because someone in debt, that's a different story. And, and I believe I, I wrote something in, in that new book you're narrating. But the, the new um, one, yes. Yeah. Yeah. But, but someone who's not yet in debt or just about, and they can get out of debt by, again, budgeting every month to pay off the debt, you can use your emergency fund as the fallback if, if you need emergency funds, right? Yeah. Your car broke down or you have a leak somewhere, a pipe burst or whatever, you don't have to use a credit card. You can take that money, but you are borrowing it from you. You're not borrowing yeah. it from the bank, you're borrowing it from yourself. Yeah. And that's really the, the, the main thing. And because you have to build it up again. The, the main purpose of that emergency account is that if you lose your job for any reason, yeah. you have three to six months while you're looking for another job to yeah. survive. Yeah. And that's really key. You're not yeah. going to get into debt. You're not going to have to go to family or friends for uh, borrowing money or you don't. It's, it's really a very big thing. And Oh, I mean, once... I actually had it. I had, we had. Yeah. We had an emergency fund of around six months uh, of expenses, including the mortgage yeah. that we no. were we were only a couple of years into when I got fired by the London radio station I was working for, which right. normally isn't a big deal because when you've been in broadcasting for a while, you can get another job somewhere. You just have to sort yourself out. It takes a little while. It'll be rough for a few months and then you'll come back. But the, this, was, this was in February of 2020 and the pandemic hit in the march and no right. radio stations wanted to even talk to me and i was mm. in serious trouble and it and that's how i ended up believe it or not ended up doing audiobooks because i went yeah. online because now we're locked down i've got to find a way to make money from home and so i yeah. took on the audiobooks and i and i've since had a couple of radio jobs and quit them because I love doing the audiobook so much and it's yeah. such a great way to to earn a living from home. But we didn't have if we didn't have that emergency fund, I would have been forced to I don't know just just get by. It would have been horrific. Yeah, you know, yeah. and we may have lost the flat. You know, I mean, it it could have happened. But there's the emergency fund that saved us. It really was. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, until I got the audio books up and running, which took about probably about three months to get it up to, yeah. you know, now I make more than I made in radio, but it took about three months to get it going. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's really the three to six months. You, you normally you should be able to figure it out. Yeah, and even if it extends beyond that, you're not going to be borrowing for much longer. It's yeah. maybe a month or two more until you figure things out. But th this is really key. And then once that happens, you start feeding it back in order to build it up again over yeah. time, right? Yeah. Because it takes a very long time to build that up. To, to, yeah. to build up three to six months of expenses is a lot. Yes, it's, yes. Not, it's not easy, right? Yeah. Especially yeah. If, you're earning, if your earnings are just covering your expenses. That's, that, that becomes very, very difficult, almost impossible. And this is why really like it has to be all of these different bits and pieces. They have to take priority over everything else. And, right. and it's very yeah. difficult because most people, they, they see people around them, whether they're buying a new sofa or going on skiing on holiday. Or a car. They, 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 all of these different things that, that are happening. And, and it's very difficult not to get caught up in that. And it takes discipline. It takes willpower which is not a very easy thing to do yeah and and that's really like it, it's a mindset that needs to change in order to get there if if people are very serious about actually getting towards that financial freedom they have to work towards it and and working is not easy Working no. is hard work, and the hard work is the temptation. The hard work is to cut down on things that you thought were necessary, but you actually, when you, when you're objective, you find like, okay, I can live without it for a few months or even years until I am more stable. Yeah, that's really the key, yeah. because then you might find 
extra jobs to do and then that extra job the side hustle that you're having becomes your main source of income and that's earning you more than what you were doing before so yeah. like it doesn't have to be all doom and gloom if you lose your job might actually be the the great thing that happens it for me it was but not at the time <laughs> at the time but, it would have been a nightmare what am i yeah. going to do you start to panic but but you didn't the panic was different from someone who didn't have that because yeah. if if it, if you were in a situation where you didn't have that emergency fund and you were depending on credit cards with, where you have to pay interest of 38% or 40% or even like some Amex cards, they have 110% interest on them, wow. right? Because they are, they are used, they, they, they make them to be used almost like a charge card. So you use it and you pay it off in full every month. Yeah. So then you're not paying that interest. But as soon as you don't pay the full amount for one month, all of a sudden that amount is exploding right yeah. and and instead of being 1000 pounds in debt you 1100 pounds in debt 1200 pounds in debt because if if you're if you're paying an interest of 110% a year that every month you're paying about 12% or something it's massive yeah so that 1000 pounds you're paying 1100 and then the following month that extra is going to be 1200 and 20 and, and and it just compounds again so yeah. so it just becomes a very big hole and it goes deeper and deeper and deeper and it, and it really is very difficult yeah and what happens was that what happened to me personally okay i i, I backtrack a little bit now and I had a situation where I was financially comfortable, all was good, and, and I decided to, okay, I'm going to stop working now, and I'm just going to do stuff for charity, right? And I started a, a big charitable project. And um, anyway, too many details and so on, but long story short, it was a matter of dealing with governments that were corrupt, and I... I lost all the money basically in that charitable project. Okay, so all the savings, all the investments, everything, my family's money, all of it, right? At what because age? At what age were you at the time? Late 30s. Okay, so still right. time to get back on track, but still, yeah, so, you should have been, you were on your way and it, now it's all gone. So until just a few years ago, I was trying to get it out and getting deeper and deeper into debt and so on. And, and then at the end, I said, reaching my mid forties, I said, you know what, that's that, you know, like I, I can't do this anymore. I've reached like not just the limit, but I've exceeded that. So no emergency funds, debt, everything is just horrendous. So I have to start over again. So again like the, the starting over the what i did was i did everything at the same time so normally when i hear um these like the the personal finance uh people talking and so on they say okay you have to focus on your debt first before you you focus on other stuff but and, and pay off the debt and so on i do agree to some extent but when you're in your mid 40s you don't have enough time to really build up your investments for the future right? yeah if yeah. you're in your 30s or 20s and you're in debt and yeah maybe if you focus on it for five years or something to clear it off that's fine yeah but then you have still 30 years to build up your whatever but if you're in your mid 40s you don't have you don't have that much if, if you're focusing on paying off the debt in five ten years you only have five ten years again to to build up investment that's not enough time really yeah. so i had to do the whole thing at the same time and this is where maybe my experience with this might not be what the books say but this is my what i personally did is yeah. that my main focus yes i am not using the credit cards or the overdraft anymore i'm trying to pay them off but my priority is building up these investments first right so starting off 
in your mid 40s with the 20 pounds a month in the sit and the 25 pounds a month in the isa because i couldn't open a lifetime isa obviously right yeah. so you're starting off from really zero right and yeah. you're starting, and you're seeing the, the the other stuff building up. You have to call the credit card companies to try and stop the interest from paying, but not to be considered as a voluntary uh, uh, arrangement. Because that, yeah. uh, exactly. But, so you have to balance all of these things, and you have to call the the bank. You have to call the credit cards while while trying to do these things, and and it just starts. And initially, like even with the family, you're trying to get them on board that we're this is what we're going to do and so on. And then they look and say, uh, it's only 20 pounds. So how is this going to happen? You know, like you really have to focus because you're not just panicking on your own. Everyone else is panicking around you, right? And that's really when you have to keep your cool and, and just be steady in what you're doing. And the uncertainty of not knowing how much you're going to be earning again right mm -hmm. because again like it's my own business i i start i reactivated it i had a corporate finance company i was lucky that that i didn't just close it down it was just you know like paying for holidays before but now it was the main thing so I had to focus on that. Then I went back into the investment world because I was luckily before uh, the pandemic, I was talking to old friends and so on um, from my investment times, you know, and they were asking me what to do and so on. And 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 I I helped them, thankfully, during the pandemic time, just before the pandemic and so on. That was like. Okay, I saw this several times in different bits and pieces. It wasn't the pandemic, but I saw the dot-com bubble. I saw before that uh, there was a financial crisis in '97. I saw it in again in 2008 in the financial crisis. I saw the Arab Spring. I saw all different bits and pieces, right? So when when you hear something that that could potentially become a massive problem, you just tell people, okay, uh, what I would do, just liquidate everything for now, just keep it in cash and let's see what happens in the next few months. Yeah. Because that's not the long-term investment money, this is the trading money, right? Even yeah, if the yeah. trade is five years in advance, but at least, you know, like, let, let's do this. And as soon as we did that, the markets came down. <laughs> it, was, it was partly lucky and yes. partly just true and from experience yeah exactly but yeah, i i won't yeah. deny the luck part right okay but as soon as soon as i as it hit that like the the, the mid-march like massive crash and i saw the day that oil went negative i just put all the money that i had with credit cards even and, and this is something that i would never recommend to anyone because this is something that i was doing Personally, I've been investing for 25 years by then, and and it's something that I worked in as a professional. It's not something, but I put all my money into that with leverage, and I was just making 100% every week. And this is something that doesn't happen every, every all the time. This is yeah. not a regular thing, but I can see that that that, that was an opportunity. Yeah. When everyone else is panicking, this is exactly what I have to do. Yeah. What I am telling people to do, I have to do myself as well. And I was lucky right. that, that it, it went that way. And I went back into the investment side of things again. But this time, I didn't want to advise the big institutions and so on. I thought, I want to do something. I only have maybe, if I'm still healthy and alive, I have about 10 years in me, right? And it's, it's something that I want to do while I'm retired. So this is it. I, I want to do something that will keep me going in my 70s and 80s. So I, I, yes, the investment world is something that I'm passionate about, but I might as well do something that I really would like to do, which is benefiting actual real life people. You know, like yeah. it's... And with that's... with with a world of experience on both sides of it. I mean, you've made, you've you've got lucky, but you've made the mistakes and you've... You, you've put things in, you've actually done it yes. and turned it round. You've actually yeah. done it. 
Yeah. So, so this is this is where, like, okay, the, the, when I say real people and real life, I still work with ultra high net worth individuals, right? Right. But, yeah. but the the other thing is because I I cannot work with the normal what is categorized as a retail investor which right. is someone who doesn't have half a million pounds to invest or they are not sophisticated. So I can only work with a sophisticated investor or if they lose a half a million pounds, it's not going to be the end of the world, right? Yeah. That, that's yeah. Yeah, like a very simplistic way of putting it. But, but I can only work with professional clients. So these are the high net worth. They have experience investing and so on. So I work with families basically that have a lot of money or people who have inherited money and so on. Then we can talk about their investments or how to structure their trusts and all of these different bits and pieces, right? Yeah. So th th that's what is called wealth management. Yeah. And yeah. Um, this is something that I'm really, really happy that I'm doing because you can actually see the benefits right in front of you. You go and, and the relationship with, with the people that you're talking to is no longer just a relationship of giving them investment advice. You're going there, they're giving you information that their families don't know anything about. You know, like, I don't know, someone who wants to uh, pay for someone that they don't want their spouse to know about or their kids... Uh, one of the kids has a disability and they need to secure that for the future or the education of uh, their cousins uh, because of something. There's all different bits and pieces that you, you get involved in, in a lot of that stuff. Or someone who wants to have like a, their spouse thought that they were retiring um, in 10 years, but they can actually retire next year. And that's a, like... A, a surprise that they want to give them and stuff like that. So th there are bits and pieces and you get really deep into the lives of people. And that's what I enjoy a lot because you're, you're always solving for something that you never thought about before. Mm -hmm. Right. But, but ultimately the, the, the mechanics of it are almost exactly the same. In, in the fact that you have different pots for different things and you have a goal over a certain period of time, how are we going to achieve this? If it's a short period of time, you cannot be investing in something like the S&P 500 or NASDAQ, but you would invest in something that fixed income, maybe bringing in 5, 6, 7% a year instead of the 10 to 12%, because you cannot risk having the money go down and you, then you need it in three years' time. Yeah. Or yeah. there are other things that are, um, that's a little bit advanced called structured financial products, which is very different. You, you can protect the capital that you're investing, but then you get a lot of the upside as well. It's, it's very complex uh, structures, but then th there are different instruments that, that we can use with more money, basically, that you can do these things with. But ultimately, that, that's like, feeling that, that I can benefit people right away there and then. Yeah. And the other thing is, but that that's never enough for me. And this is why I started writing the books, right? It's I yeah. thought, even if one person reads it, that's enough for me. You know, like if, if it, if it opens uh, something in their minds, you know, about like it takes something in their brain and, and then they, that helps them in any way, that's more than enough. So if a hundred people read it and they say, oh, this is rubbish, and one person actually finds something useful there, that would be great. Yeah. So for me to work face to face with someone, it's very limited because I, I can only, I only have so many hours per day. Yeah. But then having a book, that's that's a different story. And, and yeah, now, I, I wrote over the past few months a few books and 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 now I'm I'm trying to combine them hopefully in in the near future into one big chunky thing. You know? Right. So. Well, the, we're, this is uh, financial freedom, and we're also I'm narrating another one for you at the moment, which will be finished by the end of this week and should be on sale yeah. within the next two weeks once we once it gets through through Audible's checks and stuff. Yeah. But financial freedom now, how did you find the next step then of turning your work into an audiobook, that process? 
Um, it's actually simple, very simple. It's, it's yeah, it wasn't simple to find the right narrator. That that was the difficult part. Right. It's like, okay. Okay. So I, because I'm the, the the examples that I gave. The first thing that I thought about because I had I had an older book. It was a very tiny thing that I I actually wrote because I was sat down with my kids one day during the pandemic. And I was talking to them about what it meant with money and stuff like that. And uh, and my my daughter was over from university, and I was talking to her, and she was just getting bored of me, you know. Like it's, uh, and um, I thought I can actually write a very simple, very short, concise something that would give at least a very basic outline. If someone has half an hour or an hour to read. They can just have that, go through it, they do it, and they forget about it, right? Yeah. So I wrote yeah. a very short book, um, and it was just like 50 pages. Um, you would find it also. Uh, it's not on Audible, but it's on, on Amazon as well. But yeah. um, it's a very, very short book. And then when I found the time later on, I thought, okay, well, I want to write a little bit more, a more like uh, complete book about this right yeah it's, um, so when when i finished writing this book i was thinking okay now i i actually would like to write something for couples because there are things that i have done wrong in my relationships at, that i could have done better so i yeah. wrote another book for couples and then about parenting like the parents what to do for your kids in order to and because again like it's something that i did for my kids early on but i didn't do enough of right, right. And, and it yeah, was yeah. something that i i wish i would have done better but again every time i think i wish i would have done something or i wish i knew that i would think well why on earth would anyone else have to go through what i have gone through i might as well tell them yeah this is something that you can do in order to avoid these mistakes so this is why i did the book that you're currently narrating it says the 40s and 50s For again like, in the 40s and 50s find yeah. yourself in debt in your 50s no money no savings nothing at all what on earth are you going to do are you just yeah. going to be working until you die or what happens you know like it's it, 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 there is always light at the end of the tunnel, but there are very difficult decisions that need to be made because the older you get, the, the, the more pressing it becomes as an issue that, that it has to be solved now. Yeah. Because you don't have the luxury of time anymore, like you're in your 20s or something. And again, like, it, it, and, and I did one for young people, like if you're in your teens, if you're still at school, you're finishing your GCSEs or A-levels, then you, you, you have to be aware of certain things that you need to do in order for you to actually live a fulfilling life and not having to worry about money. So yes, yeah. money doesn't make you happy, but the lack yeah. of money can make you miserable. And I can tell you that. <laughs> it's, it, it, it is really, really not great, right? Yeah. It's, it's so, so this is why I'm trying, like every time I'm writing one, I'm thinking, oh, I wish I would have done that. And then I would write a new book. So now I think I've covered most of the different bits and pieces, but instead of just having a book here and a book there, I might just combine everything into one big one and yeah. putting it into sections in, in terms of like, the general theme that runs through of what are investments, how to invest, what are the different types of accounts that are there that one can look at and so on. And, and once this is done, because I was doing this again, like the, you can do it as a very generic American US dollar, whatever. But I, I don't live in the States anymore. I used to live there as a student. I went to boarding school in the US and so on, but that was a very long time ago, right? And I'm sure that a lot of people can talk about different accounts in very detailed whatever, but I live in the UK and this is what I know, right? And yeah. that's really... So I thought, okay, I might as well just stick to what I know I'm good at and what I understand at least 
and 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 then say that if if you're living everywhere else the theory is exactly the same you yeah. might not have for instance in the states you might not have that the, like something like a sip but you have the uh ira or roth ira which yeah. is again a tax efficient thing for uh investing for retirement and so on yeah. so this is again like you can adapt it to whichever country you're in it doesn't have to be in an isa it doesn't have to be in a sip it doesn't have to be in all of these different bits and pieces you can just have a normal investment account that you divide your in the money inside it into different pots so yeah. if you decide that you're going to be investing 50 pounds in this and 50 pounds in that okay you're investing 100 pounds a month and you know that half of it is for this and half of it is for the other and yeah. and that's it it makes it a little bit less fancy or <laughs> or yeah. or but you can still do it generally so but because i'm talking about specific uk examples i needed for example uk narration right, right. so the british accent and and you put something like this on on the acx website and that was the difficult part for me this is why i'm saying like it's the difficult the difficulty of finding the narrator you say this and you find i don't know some obscure someone who doesn't have any kind of like they, they barely speak english and they <laughs> like why 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 are you doing this i i specifically asked for a british accent if you think this is a british accent i could have done it i don't have a very great accent myself but i want it for a uk audience so this is why it needs to be with a british accent but that's that's basically it so i get americans i get south africans i get some like the all kinds of accents and and again like having to go through that that was i guess the the most challenging part it took it, it took longer than i thought it would yeah till i found someone like you who can actually <laughs> read <laughs> <laughs> well it was a very very enjoyable book to do very very educational and i know that i have uh, picked up things that that we've adapted to my wife and I's uh, situation oh, that I, I think I think will help us. Uh, it's called financial freedom. Uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, there's a link in the description to the um, to Amazon where you can get the audio book or you can get the ebook or, or whichever way you want to get it. Do you have a website as well, Hassan? Is there anywhere else we can get in contact with you? Um. I do have a website, but it's not very good. Like it's, it's just a, a personal thing that I had when I was, when I was sure. a sports person. And then I so where's, where's the best way to find you? Because I know you've done stuff on YouTube. You've got other YouTube stuff, yeah? I did for a while, yeah. And I did a bit okay. on TikTok as well. Um, yes. But, um, yeah, so I guess, yeah, well. They, they, just Google Hassan Afifi. You'll find some stuff on there if you want to find it. The important yeah. thing to do, though, is to get this financial freedom book, as, you know, whether you want it as an audio book or, or as an e-book. The link is in the description there. Okay, yeah. we've got this other one coming up. We've got this 40s and 50s one that's a few weeks away. Uh, and what else is happening for you? The, is, is the other thing the, the big bundle of all of, of all of the information into one big bundle? Right, so... Yeah, the other ones, uh, not all of them are audiobooks. So yes. maybe a couple of them. I, I had some that, that were narrated uh, already, but they took longer for some reason to uh, to come out. Um, okay. Sure what, um, right. I also have some uh, a couple of books uh, for entrepreneurs, so starting a business while working <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, uh, and avoiding business mistakes that I have yes. done myself. Uh, so yeah. uh, underfunding a business or certain things like that. But um, for the financial freedom part, uh, I think now there are maybe five, maybe six books, and, and I'm just going to combine these all into one big one. And uh, yeah. as I said, there is something for couples, the 40s and 50s, the young people, uh, and and, uh, and then I, I just want to combine all of that into one big one instead of just having... Well, you can, you can yeah. on uh, Amazon with eBooks and also with audiobooks, 
Where you you can bundle books that you've done and sell yes. them as a bundle, and I've done that for, yeah. for certain authors. So if you need any help with yeah, that, there let is me know. a lot of competition, unfortunately. In in okay, in these. this is why I want to combine them into one into big a one. single book. I see. Yeah, okay, yeah. yeah, that makes more sense. So it's a more efficient way to to get the information. Yeah. You just yeah, get it yeah. in there. Because, yeah, the, the the other books I have are like the, the, this is the one that you have at the moment. It's, yes, uh, I have these in print as well. Yes. Um, but a big one, I, I might actually have one that's hardcover and so on. Uh, right. Uh, that's, uh, we'll see how it goes. Yeah. All right. Well, good <laughs> luck with that. Many pages and so on. That's, uh, well, and thank you for, for choosing me as your narrator, Financial I, I, Freedom. I realize now that I've just spoken nonstop. Talk and I didn't well, that's really better than me speaking. For you to ask me any questions, or no, or I didn't need to ask you any like, questions. I, I want to know what you thought of the book. Like, oh, uh, I loved I, I I thought it was really good, and it was one of those books that I find at the end of the day when Julie says to me, uh, What have you been working on today? and I say, Yeah, oh, I've been working on this book, uh, Financial Freedom. You know, it's uh, it's really interesting that uh, you know, this is how this works, and you know, do you know the stock market is always return if you look at it long term, and that's it, you know, mm -hmm. and all these little things uh, uh, about it, and uh, and it, it it is a really really interesting book. It's it's a sh and one of the things I actually ended up saying to her was, I said, isn't it weird that we do all those years of schooling from a kid from like five years old to whatever age you, you've exactly. seized full-time education. <laughs> and we let, we get our heads filled with all this mathematics and geography and history and, and, and English and all the rest of it. And we're not talking anything about financial freedom when it's the most important thing. You've just basically said, I'll just go out there and work that out for yourself. Absolutely. You know, this is, this, it's, it's mad, isn't it? That, that the school is supposed to prepare you for life in some way. And there's nothing, you know, maybe some people do study economics at school, but there's not just the everyday. But again, studying economics doesn't give you any of that stuff. No, I mean, I, I left school and I knew how to multiply two matrices together, but I had no <laughs> idea how a mortgage worked. You know, it's still maths. It could be, it could be in maths as part of yeah. that, you know, if they wanted to. But it should really be a separate thing altogether and it's yeah, that's why yeah. people like you are saving people Hassan I hope I hope so <laughs> and this is like why I, I did that one for young people as well like yes. I did something for like if you're 16 to 18 or something and it's just something that is a bit like watered down simpler and, it, and it's just straightforward and and it doesn't talk like in 60 years time and stuff like that it's just yeah so th yeah. th this, like, what I would love to see, like you say, is that something like this is taught at school. So it's yes. really, really key for, for people to actually, it's it's not rocket science. It's not very complicated. It's very simple. And, and it's just a matter of, like, you need to buy food and pay your bills. You have to make sure that this is done as well, because that's how you're going to be comfortable in life. It's yeah. It has to be yeah. a basic thing. It's, uh, yeah. 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 It should be up there with reading and writing. I mean, it should just be, it just be just one of those things that you talk because it's yeah. so important. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, good to talk to you. Continued success. Right. And we'll talk again when the next book comes out. Well, so, thank you uh, very much yeah, we'll, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. We'll talk again when the next one comes out. But right now, the one that is out there that I was lucky enough to be chosen to narrate is called Financial Freedom. It's by Hassan Hafifi. And all the links you need are in the description if you're watching this on YouTube. Thank, thank you very you much, much, Hassan. Thank you.